My name is Chris Fernari. I'm the editor of Brewbound, and uh, we're going to have a couple of panel discussions today. I, I keep wanting to say this evening because we usually do these in the evenings, but we're having afternoon beers on this fine Friday here before Saver. Um, so uh, the first panel, we're going to call up our, our guests right now. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, experiential marketing strategies for craft brewers. Uh, Saver is a big you know, experiential event for a lot of consumers, beer and food pairings, obviously a, a popular approach, but there are a lot of different ways that you can engage uh, the consumers in your market and in markets maybe where you're not totally present and uh, you're selling beer, but you're not based there. So uh, these folks that we have coming up have a, a bunch of experience doing that, both in-home markets and away markets, so we're going to talk about that. Uh, please welcome to the stage Sam Caligioni, the founder and CEO of Dogfish Head, Adam Lambert, the Chief Revenue Officer of BrewDog, and Todd Osman, the President of Goose Island Beer Company. Thanks, guys. Are we going to get through that whole 12-pack? <clears throat> so, uh, Sam, you make any news lately? Yeah, it was a big. It was a big week. I guess it was a week yesterday. I uh, I actually traveled out to Arizona on last Thursday, and the one of the first bars that I got to. Oh, where are you from? Oh, we're from Boston. Uh, oh, did you hear the news? And I said, Well, what what news is that? What did I miss? I'm like, oh, Boston Beer bought Dogfish Head, and I was like, Oh yeah, I think I might know something about that. <laughs> Uh, You're one of the first people that we call, Chris. Thank you. I appreciate that. So uh, before we dive into the, the marketing stuff, I'm sure everybody has a few questions, so I'll just toss a few at you right now um, about the deal, and then we can, we can get into the marketing stuff. But um, yeah, you know, I guess what prompted you and Mariah to uh, sell, and sell Dogfish and merge with Boston Beer at, at this moment in time right now? Well, I mean, I... I think on our, our stages before, I've kind of referenced that visual of kind of the a jaws of death moment in our industry, smiling jaws of death, because you better be having fun while you navigate it or why get up and go to work every day. But I think it's a very different world than 20 years ago when a brewery like Bells or, or, or Stone or Dogfish could see a clear path from a tiny little local brewery model to selling beer coast to coast, and now it's sort of a, a very different reality where, uh, you know, the lower jaws, all the tap room breweries, I would be a hypocrite if I didn't support that because we have a, a brew pub and that's a beautiful thing, but it's obviously put a lot of pressure on the beer industry, especially the three-tier system, especially on premise. And then on the top jaw, you've got sort of the top 50 IRI defined craft breweries, and when that, that jaw smiles, it's kind of hard to see the ones that are in the back of that top 50 uh, from, from the marketplace and the guys with the market power up towards the front of that front jaw. Um, so it becomes really hard if you look at what our top 50 defined RRI craft breweries and, and look at perhaps the growth trends of those that chose to stay within the indie craft beer definition. It's, it's, a, it's a challenging moment to get market power, go up the totem pole of the ever decreasing number of strong distributors and, and navigate that, that moment. And so with Jim, we've been buddies for 20 years. We've collaborated on beers. We've walked you know, Capitol Hill to help get tax relief, you know, members of the board of the BA. So longtime friends and over beers at the Extreme Beer Fest in Boston uh, in February is really where we said, we were talking about his marathon beer and Sequench, and we were like, oh yeah, I guess they're not that close when you, when you try them and think about it. And then we're looking at our whole portfolios and just like, wow, our portfolios really don't compete. Um, they're very complementary from lagers to tonics to ciders to ales and, and spirits and sours for us. So that complementary uh, portfolio concept and... Uh, our complementary cultures, they're people first, product sep second company. Uh, their glass door scores are higher than ours. So we're, we're learning from each other on, on what each, each of us do well. And I think we got, you know, complementary uh, superpowers to continue what we're doing. We're still less than 2% market share uh, in a world where, you know, I think it's uh, 80, over 80% 80 market share for, th for three or four international companies here. So still very, very small, but a little, uh, uh, a little, a little less small. Yeah, well, it was back in I think uh, 2015 
when you sold a 15% stake to LNK, a private equity firm, and I think at the time you had you know, sort of indicated that you wanted to keep Dogfish a family-run business, and that um, the deal with LNK sort of gave you time to figure out whether or not it would be a generational play. So what's changed in that time that, it, that made it not a generational business? Well, I would say, uh, you know, in the era where we did that, uh, brought in that investor to have sort of a sophisticated partner to navigate a very competitive moment in our industry, um, we were super glad to have them in every moment. And they knew we had no plan of going to an IPO, no plan of selling out to a, an international company, but they still went on that journey with us, obviously, you know, expecting a, a, a serious return on their investment. And the, hot, and the horizon was out there for sure, but that didn't drive the merger decision. Mariah and I were running Dogfish at less than a one, one-time debt to, you know, debt. we could have paid off our, our debt within one year if we stopped investing on CapEx. So we could have levered up debt and taken L&K out and stayed you know, just family owned, just us. But we really looked at the filters at that moment and said, whatever we, whatever we do at this competitive moment, there's some, there's some hot, hard lines in the, in the sand. Staying within the BA definition of indie craft, making sure whatever we do gives our coworkers opportunities for growth, um, and Caligioni leadership. So this is truly a merger, not an acquisition, in that the Caligioni family did not take one cent out of this deal other than closing costs, and uh, we established a substantial foundation called the Beer and Benevolence Foundation to allow us to con continue to give back to the communities that give us our sustenance. Other than that, Mariah and I just took it all in stock. So we're the second largest owners now of Boston Beer, non-institutional owners behind uh, Jim Cook and his wife. And uh, I have a seat on the board, same title as Jim, same salary as Jim. But it's true that I don't have ultimate control now. And that's a that was a leap of, of faith. But really for me and Mariah, it was an existential moment where we said we'd rather, we'd rather have our, uh, the two of us give up some quote unquote power to make our brands more powerful and the opportunity for our coworkers to grow uh, more powerful. So that was the decision we made. Yeah, so it sounds like you're pretty bullish on the future of Sam stock then, if you're willing to take it all in. <laughs> it was a great moment five years ago when I was taking a little boat up the east coast with my son. We were raising money for the Nature Conservancy. We, it's a 19-foot whaler from you know Delaware to New York to Block Island to Boston. And as we pull into Block I or Boston and we're, we're, we're getting the boat, my son's fucking sick of me at this point. He's 14 years old and your dad's your, the Antichrist when, you, when you're that age. <laughs> so as we're coming in, like in, in with the tide, we see this thing in the water. It's a hat. And it's a hat that says uh, Sam Adams on the front and owner on the back. It must have been from one of their shareholder meetings. And the rest of the way up the coast, my, my son's like, fuck you, I'm now an owner of Sam Adams. <laughs> oh, that's cool, Sammy. So he still has that hat. And while you say this isn't a generational business, I don't want to put the weight of the world on his shoulders, but he's choosing to be a brewer in our R&D world. And who, who knows what will happen in the future. Very cool. Well, it, it does sound uh, like some are suggesting that you know, you're sort of the, the heir apparent to, to Boston beer now as the, uh, uh, Jim's plan has always been just to not die. Um, so now it seems like, now it seems like Jim can die and then you just take over. Is that how it's going to work? No. Like one of the driving factors of the mer merger was, you know, not just a 0.14% market share company's opportunity with a less than 2% in share beer company, but when we signed the documents, I got the recipe to his, his serum that allows him to live forever. So <laughs> we're going to be doing this shoulder to shoulder with each other pretty much till the end of time. That's very, <laughs> you found the fountain of youth. Congratulations. Um, so you've got to spend 30% of your time in Boston. Does this mean we get to have more beers now together? Yeah, I hope so. Uh, you know, it's basically roughly 20 to 30 percent of my time is what I'll spend up in New England, and I'm going to be focused a lot on innovation. Thank you, Trish. Um, as I always have been, they've got a beautiful new five barrel system uh, going in uh, to their Faneuil Hall brew pub, in addition to the beautiful 10 barrel that they have in uh, Boston, Jamaica Plain. So, yeah, I'll be spending a chunk of time up there. I got to go to a Red Sox game two nights ago where my in Fenway, where my dad, grandfather once saw Ty Cobb play, and at the Boston bar. Big Pappy came up. He knew someone that was over there. And I got a, p a photo of Big Pappy drinking a, a sea clench. And I got the photo, and I was like, what do you think? He's like, oh, man, I could slam some of these back on the beach 
in Miami. And uh, <laughs> I, I was like, can I use the photo and what you just said in an ad? And he said, no. <laughs> Well, you know, at least you got Sequench at the Boston uh, Sam Beer Garden now yep. at Fenway, right? Yep. Nice. Uh, all right. Well, let's let's jump into some of the marketing stuff. I mean, we could do this all day, but um, I want to make sure that Todd and Ad Adam, who also, by the way, used to work for Dogfish Head a few years ago, was their VP of sales. So it's all kind of coming full circle here. Uh, I want to get their thoughts and, you know, try to understand how you guys at your companies are you know, navigating this competitive moment. Like Sam said, there are more than 7,400 breweries out there now, and it's pretty difficult to stand out. Um, so how do each of you guys, you know, sort of approach the marketplace and reach new consumers and carve out your own little spaces for BrewDog or Goose Island or Dogfish? And I'll kick it all the way down to Adam. Yeah, I think it's... It's no secret that we have our equity for punks, which I think is truly unique for us. It's BrewDog. We have uh, 108,000 shareholders around the country. That's that's. Yeah. Mazel tov. <laughs> I get to shotgun a beer after that one. Um, <laughs> so we've created a community that's really engaged in what we're doing. They're bought into our brand. They're bought into the brewery. They're bought into the vision. We've created a culture for these guys, and I think that's a big part of our success currently. We have 108,000 around the world. We have 13,800 here in the U.S. Uh, we're going to do another Equity for Punk raise July 4th in the U.S. So I think that's been a big part of our marketing strategy and our initiative and, and creating a culture and a community with these guys. And they're not just guys that put money into, into BrewDog. They're all so heavily involved in what we're doing. We have a, a Equity for Punk's council that are going to be weighing in on some of the things we're doing. They do a lot more stuff in Europe with the equity for punks with beer creation. So engaging those guys has been huge for us in terms of uh, marketing. Yeah, definitely. Todd, how about for Goose? Um, you know, you guys are a, a Chicago born brand, but obviously national now with uh, Anheuser-Busch. And um, I think the, lo the largest brand in the Anheuser-Busch craft portfolio. So how does Goose Island uh, build its its brand out in the marketplace in a, a wide variety of markets. Sure. So we've, you know, we've changed over the years how we look at that. Um, I think in the early days, and I, I was there back in 1988. It was just a story of craft, and that that worked worked for us. Um, and we, we always had our unique differentiation, but we didn't need to tell that story at the time. Uh, now I think we're digging deeper into the stories we've always told but you know you said the word Chicago uh, we always wondered if that had relevance around the country we think it does uh, we've learned that so we've we've refocused back on Chicago uh, we think we have a differentiator in that we're from a city um, with national distribution there's not a lot of nationally distributed craft beers that really focus on that urban influence uh, so we're using that as a differentiator <coughs> Sam uh Rehoboth Beach. Mecca. Yeah, humongous urban center for craft beer. Um, <laughs> other than, uh, you know, obviously building a unique portfolio of offerings, and you guys for years obviously have stood out as off-centered ales for off-centered people, um, what's sort of the key way that you differentiate dogfish in the marketplace today? Um, yeah, it's pretty challenging to be in a rural coastal area, so we're two hours from D.C., Baltimore, Philly, um, and three and a half from Manhattan, uh, where I think Frank Zappa once said, you can't be a legitimate country unless you have uh, a sports team, an airport, and an army. And all, we have Dover Air Force Base, but we're the only country, state in the country that doesn't have a commercial airport and no pro team. So, But it's, a, it's great to be able to live at the beach, and I think our, our brand kind of reflects that sort of relaxed you know, cre creative, relaxed uh, vibe, very friendly, approachable vibe that I think part of the DNA of that is being at a beach where there isn't a big big city around. Um, I wouldn't trade it for anything because we get to be in, c you know, a local brewery in D.C., Baltimore, Philly, and Manhattan. We can get to all those markets. Uh, so using uh, that fact that we are relatively central to those 
urban markets to get out, do media, do events, but also be thoughtful about partnering with, with, with folks on events. You know, we started as the smallest brewery in the country. It was always hand selling when every pint was made and sold in the same building. I've always kind of been the analog face and voice of Dogfish, Mariah, the, the digital, and now with folks like Trish and Kenyon, you know, we're still events focused and social media focused for our, our marketing. Yeah, for sure. Um, you do have the Firefly Festival, though. Not to be confused with the Fire Festival uh, in, in Delaware. Thankfully. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so we talk a lot about occasions and, uh, you know, having the right beers available at the right times and, you know, in the right places. And I think that you know, if you look at sort of the construct of each of your portfolios, um, you can kind of see where you got the, the occasions that you guys are going after. Um, certainly Goose Island has, uh, you know, a, a, a higher end grouping of beers with its Bourbon County Stout and some of its Matilda and higher end uh, lines. All of you guys obviously have a core portfolio. Sam, you've really gone after the active lifestyle. Um, and at BrewDog, it's a bit more traditional kind of across the board. Um, how do you guys identify the occasions that make the most sense for each of the individual brands in your portfolios and, um, you know, really start to hone in on the places where it's best to place those brands for those occasions? Sure, I'll start. Um, so we have been fortunate to have a very diverse portfolio all along. Um, we did identify food as, as a good occasion for us very early on when we started working with uh, Belgian wild ales. And I still, I still think that's a huge opportunity, but that, that got us into that scene right away. Um, I'd say we don't identify these opportunities, they're just natural partners for us. For example, uh, with Bourbon County, we're, we're very good friends now with the bourbon suppliers and the bourbon makers. We were here in D.C. Uh, about a month ago for Whiskey Fest, uh, and, and we had a presence at Whiskey Fest. So we're really starting to, with food, we've always pulled from the wine guys, but we're starting to activate a little bit more in the, uh, in the spirits world. So I, I wouldn't say we identify it. It's just a nat natural thing that happens for us. And Sam, with the active lifestyle brands, you know, you guys have the, the Warrior Dash, um, or the, the Warrior Series uh, that you guys partner with. Um, how did that come about, and I guess, why does it make sense for Dogfish? Because it, it did come a little bit before you guys went full into uh, Slightly Mighty and Super 8. It came about a year ahead of that. Yeah, I mean, well, well, I, we really kind of stumbled into the concept of orienting, you know, some beers towards active lifestyle when we first released Namaste you know, over a, a decade ago. And over a decade ago, we started doing pints and poses. In fact, Trish uh, hosts those as, as the yoga instructor. And we started seeing on social media stuff that, that popping up. And so that really was our first foray into active lifestyle. But then Sequench uh, was certainly kind of amplified our intentions to really deeper explore uh, that space. So yeah, some of the things we do marketing wise, you know, we designed this activity box that is a, a functional cooler. It's treated with this environmentally safe um, uh, spray that allows it to hold ice so people can take a mixed 12 pack of our four active lifestyle beers out on their own adventure. Um, so we'll be doing a lot of marketing around that. Uh, this summer and you know warrior dash is another component of that we did a small capsule line of old school coaches jacket and hat with new balance to celebrate Janu quenchy where you commit to just drinking sequench for, th for that first month of the year so just finding those unique opportunities per per brand and making sure it feels authentic and, and right before you jump into it yeah now obviously it all has to translate to the experience too for the customer so you know, you can have good ideas and you can put them down on paper, but you still kind of have to activate them out in the marketplace. Um, and you have to build uh, a cost structure that enables you to do so uh, in a profitable way. So I'll kind of lean on our, our chief revenue officer over here, Adam. You know, when you're thinking about uh, building an experiential marketing budget and you know, marrying the different types of uh, brands and the identities that they have with the experiences that you want to create, what's the best way to you know, start penciling this stuff out? 
So every year we used to do planning at Dogfish, I'd walk over to Sam and ask him, what's your slush fund this year look like? And how much do you want to spend? And then I'd work backwards on that end for me. I'd put Sam's money over here and then start to pencil in our mar marketing budget over here. Um, but I think it's really like, I think we've all got to stop spending money on CapEx and we got to start spending money on sales and marketing. I mean, it's, this is, needs to be the biggest investment in our industry right now. So when, I, when I'm building out budgets, I'm taking a lot of the big picture ideas, using the old SAM method and penciling in what I think these things are going to cost and then all the pieces that go along with it to build up to that. So it's really coming up with a lot of you know, 10, 12, 14 big picture, big concept ideas, whether it's some sponsorships, some events, some initiatives, some, and some consumer-driven activities, some wholesaler-driven activities, and some retailer-driven activities, and start up here, and then work down with all the detailed stuff, and then work back up, and then just see where it fits in per barrel, per heck, per case, or per gross revenue. So I really don't have this magical equation it's more just like coming up with the ideas and then building up because all the work is really in the details. I mean, you could say, hey, I'm going to spend 50 grand on this. By the time you're said and done, it's 65, 70, or 40. So it's really get up here and then work down and just spend the time to work down. But right now, making investment in sales and marketing is, is I think for me personally, is, is ground zero. It's critical. Yeah. How, how many states are, is BrewDog in in the U.S. now? Ten. Ten states and then D.C. and then we're probably be in 15 by the end of the end of this year. So that's an interesting point that you bring up. You know, the, the industry over the last, I don't know, five, seven years has, like you said, spent a lot on CapEx, really grown capacity. Now it feels like we're, you know, collectively at a point where there might be, you know, even an oversupply of capacity. Um, and you're suggesting that businesses start to kind of readjust how they're spending and start to allocate more towards marketing. So I guess on a percentage basis, like what was it you know, during the years of CapEx spending and what do you think it should get to moving forward in order to start you know, kind of growing this, this whole category from the marketing side? I, I honestly couldn't give you an answer on that. I mean, it's, it's literally year by year on what you want to grow. I mean, you could put some measurables in in terms of what it costs per barrel, per case start to pencil it all out, but I, I couldn't give you like, hey, it's got to be a p this percentage of revenue right now. I just think that we have got to be super smart and we've got to spend a, a, a lot more on sales and marketing than we have in the past and between all three levels. I mean, you got to have your wholesaler spend, your retailer spend, and your consumer spend, and you got to have three separate budgets for those. I couldn't give you where it sits as a percentage of revenue or as a percentage as a per barrel cost. I just know that we've got to over-index. And if we do spend more collectively as an industry on the sales and marketing piece, what do you think is the result of that? Like, what's the outcome of that? Hopefully, beer overall in America returns to, to growth, you know, because, you know, for us, I think we're, to, to Adam's point, we don't say it has to be this percentage, but I think we're about 3% of our revenue goes to marketing, and that doesn't count awesome social media people and salaried uh, people. That's like spend in the marketplace is about... Is it, about 3%, but it's just such a unique moment where the growth is in the long tail of the, te the, 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 the tasting rooms um, outside of the three-tier system, and that's a great thing, but for the vibrancy of the three-tier system long-term, top 50 IRI-defined craft has to figure out a way to grow faster than we are right now, or uh, the challenge is if we don't spend on sales and marketing, our products are going to get commodified and just and just sold by on price, and we could live in a, a moment where millennial consumers say, "I'll pay fifteen dollars for a four pack waiting online at DC Brow or, or a, a other half will DC Brow uh, distributes it, other half or Treehouse, but I'm not going to pay more than fifteen dollars for a, a fifteen pack in the three tier system at a liquor store, and then we're all fucked." Yeah. <laughs> all right then, <laughs> uh, Todd. I'll, I'll kind of rephrase the question for you, um, you know, w when you're operating within uh, an entity like Anheuser-Busch, uh, how does the marketing spend and your ability to spend on, you know, unique creative uh, initiatives, whether it's setting up a field goal uh, kicking competition in the middle of winter or anything else, doing a, you know, high-end beer and food pairing, how does that change when 
you know, it ladders up to a, to a corporate entity like that? So probably not as much as you think. We, uh, we actually, our marketing, sales and marketing spend is appropriate to what our net revenue is. Um, I would say it's industry standard. So we're not, we're not over-investing on that side. Uh, we're spending what we should, but maybe where we are over-investing is in our people. Uh, so a good way that we're able to activate all these things and come up with these ideas and I think save money in the long run and it's good advice for everybody is by having the right people. For example, uh, we have a carpenter on our, our marketing team who, who builds a lot of stuff for us. We have a certified cheese professional on our marketing team who really helps us get in with that industry and work on pairings and stuff like that. So I think a lot of things that we may have to outsource our marketing dollars towards, we, we use internally. What's the advantage of that? Well, authenticity f for one, nimbleness for, for two. Uh, you know, we could be a lot quicker. Uh, these people understand the culture and the message of Goose Island. So, uh, but, but long term, I, I think it, it does save you money. So invest in your people. Yeah. You talk about the nimbleness component. And, you know, I sort of mentioned the, the field goal competition. And maybe you can share that story. Uh, because I did think it, it demonstrated pretty clearly, you know, your ability to take an event that was totally unrelated to beer and turn it into a moment where you activated around the brand. And you did so very quickly within the span of a week. Um, so maybe for those folks in the audience who aren't quite as familiar, share the story and, you know, explain sort of what the checklist was of, you know, is this you know, going from is this something that we want to try to capitalize on to making it a reality? Sure. So, uh, again, we couldn't have done it without the, the people, but I'll, I'll tell you the story of how it happened and explain it for those of you that aren't familiar. But uh, the Chicago Bears got knocked out of the playoffs this year when our kicker missed one of many field goals. And this, this was the end of the game, and it, we called it a double doink. He hit the goalpost twice and one of my marketing guys was at the game and as he was leaving the game it, he said it sounded murderous for for the kicker uh, people were not being very kind to him and you know he he had that same thought at first and thought you know ah this guy ruined it for us but then he started feeling sorry for him and he said you know what it was not an easy kick to make so he he literally texted me maybe a half hour after the game with the idea and right away I just said you know great idea let's do it and I think we were the first two at the brewery the next morning, eight o'clock, and I, I walked right up to him and just said, "So what are we doing? When are we doing it?" And by eleven o'clock that morning, that morning we had tweeted something out, and by three o'clock we had Googled, uh, you know, YouTubed how to make a field goal, and uh, our carpenter got on it, and next thing you knew, it was it was off and running. So that that came from a guy just being able to tweet me, you know, on the spot, and we jumped at it. You guys set up a, a field goal post outside of the brewery, and you had how many people come by? To I mean, you had a limit on who could participate, but there were still hundreds of people watching. Yeah, so we, we put a challenge out to, to people and said, if you think it's so easy, why don't you come out and show us, show us how you can do it? And, uh, you know, we were scared we were going to have 13,000 people come out and try to kick the field goal, and that would have taken, you know, all week. So we said first 100, uh, you know, it reminded us of Bourbon County Stout. There were people waiting at uh, 6 in the morning, already there, uh, for a 1 o'clock start. And, uh, you know, I talked to every guy in line, and I'll tell you that 80% of them were 100% sure they were going to make it. <laughs> what um, percent made it? What's that? What percent actually made it? Yeah, so 0% made it. <laughs> um, and, you know, they... they they didn't expect there were news cameras all over there. There were 3,000 people that came out to watch them. People were screaming and yelling at them, and they felt the pressure. We did open our tap room to them uh, before, I will say, so they had a few beers. But, um, yeah, so it, but it, it translated to uh, not only local coverage, but that, that garnered us you know, global coverage. And we, we like to put it in terms of impressions, and earned impressions are where it's at, but th those were through the roof. But overall impressions were... Uh, 555 million impressions, which to put in perspective, you know, we, we kind of joke that we want a Super Bowl ad. 98 p million people watch the Super Bowl, and that's a $5.8 million buy. So for about $3,000, we captured five times that amount of uh, awareness and people watching us. And it was authentic to the, to the brewery. I don't think, uh, you know, John Hall was always a very inclusive guy, not a, 
not a rebel or anything like that. So we were sticking up for one of our own in Chicago, and it, and it came through. And I don't think that would have happened if, if our own employee didn't understand the culture of Goose. Yeah, so uh, there's a great lesson there, which is, you know, encouraging anybody with an idea to, you know, raise their hand and say, hey, how about this? Um, how do you take something from idea stage to execution and, you know, uh, make, make it make sense not only for the brand image that you're trying to maintain in the marketplace, and then from a cost standpoint, I mean, this was cheap, right? It was a few thousand bucks, like you said. Now, had somebody uh, made the field goal, you would have been sending them to the Super Bowl uh, and <laughs> paying, paying for a, a full experience, we right? Were, we were ready to scalp tickets, actually, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that might have uh, cut into the budget a little bit more. But, um, you know, I think you guys were able to do something really unique, really creative, and, you know, I'm trying to draw out sort of the, the lesson here and the learning of uh, being able or, or not being afraid to take risk and associate your, something, uh, your, your brand with something like this. How do you go from idea to execution and you know, get everybody to give the thumbs up, especially as you grow and there's more people that w need or want to give a thumbs up to things? So, That's uh, for everyone. Yeah, for, so for us, I mean, you know, people give me a lot of credit and I, I deserve zero credit. All I do is give permission to these guys. Uh, so I do poke them to take risks, but they know that you know anybody in the company can come forward with an idea. And, and sometimes I, I have a pretty good idea that it's not gonna work, but I want them to know that their ideas can, can get a shot. So um, well, I think once you, once you open that up, the ideas will just flow. And then you just have to have the, the team that knows how to execute and be used to executing quickly. Yeah, it's all about the team. I mean, it's really like being able to be nimble, having a great team around you, having the, the creative ideas. I mean, we, I just got the story this morning. I, I've been disconnected from the brewery for a couple of days with this launch in D.C., but we had the, it's a band, Lamb of God. It's a heavy metal band that reached out to us, uh, drinking a nanny state N.A. beer on their plane, coming over for a music festival in Columbus, DM'd us, said, this is the greatest beer we've ever had. Uh, our uh, cast in charge of social media, marketing, reached back out to them, hey, we're, we're gonna be at Sonic Temple, we're gonna be a sponsor. They reached back out to us, hey, we'd love to come have a beer with you. This happened yesterday. And met at our Franklinton uh, pub. It's the first time the band had had a beer together, two of them don't drink, two drink. It's the first time in eight years that the four of them had sat down and had a pint together. And that literally came from a DM through Instagram of one of their guys, the lead singer, drinking a nanny state, best non-alcoholic beer he's ever had. I don't think he's had that many. And so <laughs> it just happened, and we were able to move so quickly with a, de with a team that's so fast and so smart, and to get them over to our pub and to have a uh, beer with them and to be the conduit for these four guys who haven't had a beer together in eight years and we were the conduit to do that and now there's a good opportunity we'll probably do the probably the first na music collaboration uh in the country so it was you know again it was the ability to move quick think fast have a great team and take advantage of something creative yeah no doubt it, and that's you know it's awesome when those things come together and your companies are able to execute that quickly on something. But then there are concepts that take a little bit longer to develop. And you know, one that comes to mind for BrewDog is this uh, trip from Scotland to Columbus. You guys charter an airplane, and now you're actually doing it the, the reverse way. So uh, you're going to be, is it uh, Equity for Punks USA? Folks now have the chance to go over to Scotland. Clearly, there's a lot more time and energy put into something like that where you're creating an experience for your customers. Maybe walk us through you know, how that process works, how you guys came up with the concept, and what it does for you long term. Yeah, I can't take any credit for this thing. This is all James Watt, our owner, who came up with it, and I think there's a lot of forward thinking on it and thinking bigger than just who we are and what we're trying to accomplish. And we were actually doing another project with British Airways to celebrate their, their anniversary, and I think that kind of sparked some ideas with James and what we could do. And again, going back to my original 
comment about our equity for punks, taking advantage of a community that wants to do something fun with us and figure out what the fun things are to do. I mean, that took a lot of long range planning on that, but once we're able to, to kind of plan it out, figure out the cost, get it done the first time, we're able to replicate it. I mean, we're actually, uh, Halloween, we're gonna fly 260 people from Columbus over to Scotland. It went on sale yesterday and we sold out 100 seats in the first 12 hours. And so I think, you know, taking that big picture, it's something that takes a lot of work. And again, going through the details and figuring it out. And once you get it figured out the first time and you're able to replicate, I think that's where the excitement starts. Are you gonna stock more uh, toilet paper on this flight? I think we're getting a bigger plane. <laughs> I heard the first one that you guys ran out and served maybe a, f a few too many beers. It's the first time in 30 years this guy's been flying that he's ever had the toilets fill up on him. So I think, yeah, we're gonna <laughs> figure this one out next time. <laughs> Uh, well, it, I mean, you know, all of these, uh, whether it's a, a, a music partnership or a Warrior Dash partnership or, you know, turning on a dime and building your own field goal or, you know, chartering a plane and figuring out how to create these experiences for your most loyal fans and e investors, um, you know, they're all great examples of creating experiences for uh, beer drinkers. But beyond the beer circle and the pie that we all know, how does the beer industry and, and brewers within it collectively start to grow this category and, and take back some of that share from wine and spirits that you've been, uh, that the category has been losing um, and, and do so through these unique experiences, be it a Saver Beer Festival or any of the other things that we've mentioned? Yeah, I'll start. I think what, what what's cool about the story of the field goal and, and the plane is that they're just really well differentiated marketing stories and in a cacophony of 7,400 brand voices, it's very hard to, 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 to do something that unique. And I think the same ideal applies to the beer world. I think in moments when, when competition is hard and, and growth is hard, too often reflexively people just look to the left or right of what's the cool thing and, and do something derivative of that. But I think now is a moment where you see these distinct concepts out punching their weight because they are so unique. And one that we're excited about that uh, and Adam was part of our team when we first built our, our rules of thumb, which is our sort of uh, cultural you know, uh, guide guideposts, and we've iterated them, but important ones for us are um, happy customers make us happy, and stop, collaborate, and listen. We're probably the only <laughs> company that has a vanilla ice uh, lyric as a as a you know cultural uh, tenant. Uh, but one that we're psyched that we're collaborating on is there's a a, a black uh, country artist based on Nashville, Jimmy Allen, who has over over two million followers on on Spotify Monthly, who was born two miles from our brewery, uh, you know, in Milton, Delaware, rural Delaware, and uh, used to ride his bike through the cannery when it was a cannery that, that then became our brewery. We heard through social that 60 Minute was his favorite beer. We know with Slightly Mighty, we think we have an opportunity to go outside the craft beer demo with something that's this approachable and uh, this low in calories. Um, knowing that he was a big hophead and that he was gonna be touring all summer, uh, we kind of made him the, he, he has a song called Slower Lower, sl about Slower Lower Delaware. That's what the, the northerners in Wilmington call the beach area, us rednecks. Uh, so we rewrote the lyrics to that uh, together and, uh, you know, doing a remix and a video around it. It was a pretty surreal moment. I was like, what fucking, what a weird job I have. Two days ago, I was writing lyrics and melodies uh, in the handicapped bath bathroom at the Philadelphia airport uh, on, a f on a script with him. I'm like, this is a weird job I got, you know, but a fun one nonetheless. So uh, that's, a, that's a collaboration that'll go on all, all year long and, and uh, not, you know, obviously introducing our brand to a demo that we probably weren't uh, reflexively expected to, to show up at. Well, we all know that you are a skilled lyricist, Sam. That I got, my, I got, I got my day job. But if it goes to shit, rhymes. Yeah, are you gonna be writing some raps or some country songs for Boston Beer then? No, we got, we did just write a song though called uh, me and me and Jimmy Allen called "My Truck's the Same Age as My Girl," <laughs> <laughs> hitting on all the country tropes. Uh. And it's true. I got a 1970 Jeep and a 1970 wife. <laughs> I'm not trading either in. Awesome. <laughs>
So Todd, you talked about uh, elevating the experience uh, around beer, pairing with food. You know, that's one way to start to get some of these uh, occasions back. But you know, as you guys look at the the wine and spirits uh, space, how are you going after that and taking share back? So again, yeah, we started doing that very early, and I think as a as an industry and as a category, we've sort of lost our way. Uh, so many people are doing it, and we're so many different directions with beer and food. I think we've made a lot of a lot of ground, but uh, we could do a much better job. So what we did, we started focusing on beer and cheese right after uh, going right after wine, wine and cheese. When you say wine and everybody says cheese, wine and cheese, but we're friends with the uh, the cheese makers, and they will tell you not not in public that they think beer and cheese go much better together than wine and cheese. They're not going to turn that down. So we've we focused our, our food program behind that uh, in a couple of ways we've done it. So we built out our barrel house. I think you've been there where we age all our beer in, in oak barrels. Uh, and we, we kept the, the event space fairly raw, but we built a really, really nice kitchen. And within that kitchen, we built an affinage, which is a, a space to humidity, temperature controlled room to, to cure and age cheese and meat. Uh, so we started hosting education classes there on beer and cheese pairings. Uh, we just recently had the the International Cheesemonger Invitational uh, competition at, at, at our space. Uh, you know, we're working with Murray's Cheese Shop in, in New York at their uh, Cheese Cave. They're, they're rubbing a couple wines, one with Matilda and one with Madam Rose. Uh, we have a program running right now with Peapod uh, that is a cross-merch online program. They're an online delivery service. Uh, pairing up beer and cheese. So my hope is we can get this to be successful, get it into the minds of the consumer, and then everybody starts imitating us. And collectively, as an industry, we start getting people to think about about beer and food together, if we can do it through a simple thing just like beer and cheese. Well, and it's, you know, connecting all the dots, you know, from the idea of a beer and cheese pairing all the way through to, you know, a, a Cross merch program with Peapod online delivery, right? So um, you have the experience in your barrel room, and somebody can, you know, take a piece of that experience away from them if they're not able to get there. Uh, so it's it's nice that you've been able to kind of connect all the dots, and that's I think the key to any successful marketing program that anybody does, right? Yeah, you need please to touch con Please confirm. <laughs> please confirm. <laughs> Experientially, uh, you have to translate it to retail, uh, do it via social, do it through partners, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Adam will give you the sort of last word here as the, uh, the old grizzled uh, veteran up here. You've, you've been all around the country. <laughs> Thanks, bro. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you've, you've worked with, uh, I mean, a number of different breweries, so you've, you've done this for a long time. You've been with Rogue, you spent some time with Virtue Cider, um, you know, obviously Dogfish, uh, you, you've, you've helped buy breweries and sell breweries. I mean, you've kind of done it all. As you start to look out at the, the future of this category and what it's gonna take to grow, um, other than investing more in sales and marketing, what's, what's your final word? I think, We've just got to do a lot more connecting, and we've got to be a, like, not. I I hate the we're not a lifestyle brand, or you know, not a healthy lifestyle is part of it. But I think we just we've got to make beer a part of everybody's lives. Like there has to be a 360 experience. Whether somehow that we're involved, and we're not a taboo, and it's alcohol and so forth. That somehow that we're whether it is being healthy or sponsoring events, or we're the conduit for people's lives. And, and I think bringing our individual brewery cultures and our people and bringing people into that fold and having people understand what we're doing as, 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 a, as, a, as a culture and, and, and kind of making sure that everybody, somehow we touch everybody in some fashion. And it's not, sure it's through consumption, but it's got to be through visiting where we are or sponsorship. I, I wrote down here, like we do a lot of non-traditional Nonprofit work. I mean, just being involved with everybody's everyday life somehow to a certain fashion, not just not just as a brand, but just as as everything that we do. I think that's what we need to do a better job as. I think we've kind of like we're a little bit isolated. I think we need to 
like to be involved with everybody all the time and 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 we got to be better at that well said how about a round of applause for these fine folks up here